All right, here we are again, uh, continuing in our series, uh, Understanding and Obeying the uh, Ten Commandments. This is uh, lesson number seven in our series entitled The Sanctity of Life. And this is part one. We're going to do two parts in this uh, particular section. Uh, let's begin by reading uh, the commandment itself uh, from Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. You shall not murder. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You shall not murder. That's commandment number six. So the sixth commandment refers specifically to the taking of human life. Um, you know, if you kill your cat, uh, you may be cruel, uh, but you're not a murderer because a cat doesn't have a human life, it's animal life. Um, now there are two purposes behind, two main purposes behind this uh, commandment. The first one is to demonstrate and maintain the nature and the value of human life. Uh, the sanctity of life is tied to the belief that humans are created in the image of God. And so aggression against another human is also aggression against God, and therefore it is wrong, it is immoral. Uh, another purpose for the uh, commandment is to protect human life in an evil world. Uh, those who believe, for example, that there is no God, they can easily be led to believe that human life is only as valuable as the service that it renders to society. For example, if you are poor or handicapped in some way, if you're old or your life is you know, uh, not productive, well then your life is not very valuable because you don't contribute much to society and it's easy to get rid of you. Uh, in, in, in nations where belief in God is widespread, every person is considered equally important because of their nature, not because of their productivity. Where there is no belief in God in communist countries, for example, there's also no problem with abortion. Uh, no problem with killing people who speak out or eliminate people like the poor and the sick, the elderly, because they are a burden and no more than just flesh, old flesh for that matter. The danger in our country is the growth of humanistic uh, philosophy in the last uh, hundred years. Humanism uh, is dangerous because it denies the existence of God, but uses ideas that come from a belief system that does. For example, in humanism, they believe that caring for the sick and poor is a good idea since this is the best way to run a society and promote peace. They don't do it because um, uh, it's a divine command. Uh, they do it uh, because they see that a system based on the principle of loving your neighbor actually works well and it serves social goals. Now, the danger is subtle but very real. You see, it's not a big step from believing in God with love to disbelieving in God with love to disbelieving in God without love. You, you can make those, you know, you can take those steps very easily. If someone comes along and says that they have a, a better plan for society uh, and they say, do it my way or we'll kill you, and they have the muscle to back it up, uh, there's no moral authority to stop them. Uh, this command establishes God as the final arbitrator over life and death, over how we treat one another and not man. Man is not the final uh, law on this. God is the final law on this. So what's the rule? You know, you shall not murder. Uh, the unlawful taking of another human life. What does this mean in everyday life? in everyday terms. So first of all, it rules out unlawful aggression. Uh, uh, one continuous line of unlawful aggression beginning with anger and including violence, rape, murder. Jesus connects anger and murder in the sense that both are on the same uh, continuum. Another, uh, another thing that uh, this command uh, deals with is suicide. Uh, we, we can permit a terminally ill patient to die naturally uh, without keeping them on a support system which might prolong their, their lives. But we cannot kill someone who requests to be killed because of depression or pain. Uh, there are many reasons why people kill themselves. You know, depression, substance abuse uh, effects, uh, great pain. But, but these things don't justify the act. 
As Christians, we believe that God will not allow us to carry more than we can bear, physically or emotionally. The commandment also prohibits abuse. Um, for example, unnecessary risks to our life or the life of others, or uh, um, unnecessary risk in order to uh, feed our egos. Uh, our bodies belong to God, not ourselves. Foolish risks to gain fame or approval or excitement or money are presumptuous before our Creator. Uh, also, the abuse of our bodies through consumption of unlawful or harmful or overindulgence of various substances, habits, etc. This includes alcohol and tobacco and illegal drugs and overindulgence in food and prescription medicine, so on and so forth. Also includes uh, damaging our bodies with overwork, overexercising, overdoing whatever, <laughs> whatever taxes the body. Christians are to bring honor to God with their own bodies and honor the bodies of others as they honor uh, their own. Now, what the command does permit, the command does permit killing in certain circumstances. Hunting and fishing, for example. I mean, animals are not human. They're not made in the image of God. They, they don't fear judgment. They don't feel guilt. There is no intrinsic difference in the value of the life of a bird or an elephant or a whale, only size and species. The issue here is not murder, but stewardship. Uh, we set the stewards, or rather we are the stewards of the earth's resources of animals. And we have to ask ourselves, are we managing this stewardship well? And are we doing it without cruelty? Um, it also includes uh, capital punishment. Now, the Bible considers life so precious that to unlawfully take one life leads to the forfeiting of our own life in many cases. We read about that in Genesis 9, verse 6, in Deuteronomy 19, Romans chapter 13. All murder is killing, but not all killing is murder, you see. God gives the state permission to execute criminals. This is seen in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Rapists, for example, were condemned to death in Deuteronomy chapter 22. Kidnappers, Exodus chapter 21. Murderers in Genesis 9 verse 6, but also in Romans chapter 13 and Acts chapter 25. Of course, there are those who argue that a God of love and mercy would not condone such a thing. And this is a, a biblical argument for the other side of this uh, issue. The balance, I believe, is found in Exodus chapter 23, verse seven. In Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 23, verse seven, the writer says, keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent or the righteous, for I will not acquit the guilty. So the goal in the consideration of the death penalty is not, you know, is it a deterrence to crime? Uh, do we use the death penalty in order to stop rape or murder or those type of things? Well, these things are always going to be with us because we live in a sinful world. No, the goal of capital punishment is divine justice carried out by God's servant, which is the state. Now, in doing its job, the state must make absolutely sure that justice is carried out fairly and in every case, because in the end, as the scripture says, God will demand a reckoning from the accused as well as those who are carrying out the justice. So we need to be very, very careful how we, um, how we uh, put this, uh, this, uh, this uh, legal uh, procedure uh, into play. Uh, another, um, another thing that this command permits is uh, police work. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, um, uh, Peter tells uh, Christians that they are to submit to legal authorities. We're not allowed to take the law into our own hands because we haven't been given the right by God or, uh, uh, you know, or the opportunity by God. God doesn't give this to the individual, He gives it to the state. Law is the duty of government and God will judge those who have served in this way. You may have a good reason to want personal revenge, but you have no legal right and no spiritual support for it. And Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Also, the command permits self-defense. 
Exodus 22 verse two says, if the thief is caught while breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltiness on his account. And so God makes provision for us to use legal means to protect ourselves. This extends to national defense as well. In Luke chapter 13 verse 14 and Acts chapter 10, the soldiers in question were not obliged to give up their roles in order to follow Christ. In other words, soldiers who, who became Christians didn't have to stop being soldiers. Uh, in Romans chapter 13, uh, Paul speaks of the legitimate right that the government has to use force in defending the country. Justified self-defense is where an individual or a nation defends itself against unjustified aggression against itself or against those it is responsible to uh, protect. So how do, we, how do we keep this command? Uh, Matthew chapter five, beginning in verse 38, gives us the idea of how we keep this command from day to day. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now this here refers to the Jewish law of restitution that said that you must repay what you have lost or stolen or, or, or damaged. The purpose was to regulate restitution so that it would not escalate to revenge. In other words, not two eyes for an eye, it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You see, to, to, to find some balance there in the process of restitution when you had been wronged. In a, in a broader sense, this also refers to the role of government, to regulate justice and mete out punishment fairly uh, for everyone. So we keep reading verse 39, it says, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn other to him also. If anyone uh, wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So here Jesus refers to the law by which the Christian lives. This law is above the law of government. The idea is that the Christian doesn't build upon evil for evil, but he overcomes evil with good. So Christians don't run the government, but in their personal lives, they do control the law by which they will live you know, in their personal lives. Christ calls us to this higher law. This doesn't mean a Christian can't protect himself or seek protection or justice from the state. I mean, even Jesus said that if his battle was on earth, he'd call 10,000 angels to defend him in John chapter 18, verse 36. You know, allowing a murderer to attack your family or violate you uh, or violate your home and, and responding by turning the other cheek, well, that's just foolish. And, and it's not really loving your family to whom you owe your first loyalty you know, in society. This type of misguided attitude actually encourages evil. Um, but obeying this command, the command not to murder, as Christians requires us to uh, exercise Christian love and forgiveness with wisdom and with proper judgment. For example, I will pray for and I will forgive uh, the drunk driver who kills one of my family, but I will also support the government's right and duty to punish this person according to the law. Both of these things are required of me and the government according to God's word. So let's summarize a little bit here. We've talked about a lot of ideas here concerning the sixth commandment. And so the sixth commandment establishes that human life is precious because it is created by God in his own likeness and the willful damage to our own or someone else's life is an act of aggression against God himself. Uh, second point, because of sin and evil in the world, God allows government to protect society against evil by punishing and executing criminals in fairness and in justice, and also defend the nation against evil power in the world. And then third big idea, uh, the Christian attitude towards evil and violent people is to try to win them over with good whenever possible, but not at the expense of what is good. Again, for example, I do not allow someone to harm me or others in order to show them that I love them, right? That, that's foolish, that's going beyond the pale. 
Okay, uh, in our next session, we're going to talk about the uh, um, uh, thou shalt not kill uh, as it relates to the, uh, to the abortion debate. But I wanted to take uh, you know, uh, an entire session to, to talk about that. For now, uh, I'll give you the uh, questions that you can use for your small group discussions. I'll see you next time. Question number one, how do you break the sixth commandment? Question number two, should the death penalty be applied in every murder case? Why or why not? Question number three, what is the spiritual condition of Christians who commit suicide? Question number four, was our war with Iraq a just war? Why?